Okay, well, welcome to the next session for um, the fourth day of, strings, of String Math 2020. Um, our next speaker is Edward Witten of the Institute for Advanced Study, who will tell us about volumes of supermodular spaces. Uh, well, thanks, Jeff, and thanks for the invitation to speak at this conference. And let me say that, like many of us, I haven't given up on hope of visiting South Africa in the near future, although unfortunately it didn't happen this summer. So I'm going to be explaining uh, how to generalize Mario Mirzakani's work on the volume of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G to the corresponding supermoduli space of super Riemann surfaces of genus G. Uh, following, uh, this was part of my paper with Douglas Stanford a year ago. I won't try to explain the context for this calculation, which involved JT gravity and random matrices as mentioned in the title of the paper. This was explained in a previous seminar, which is available online. And also uh, an overview was written up in this article. So it's kind of impractical to both explain the context for the work and also the purely geometrical part of the work in one lecture. So in effect, I've split it into two lectures and this is part two, it's independent of part one though, on the purely geometrical side. <clears throat> so there's some related work I should mention. There was a paper by Wang, Penner and Zaitlin on the super McShane identity, uh, which plays a role that you'll hear about later. And then there's two papers by Paul Norbury. One where he introduced uh, independently and before us the relevant spectral curve. And the second in which he proved that a generating function of the super volumes satisfies a KDV equation. I'm going to begin by reviewing the work of Mirzakani. So first of all, she studied Riemann surfaces as hyperbolic two manifolds. So in other words, every Riemann surface Y that we're going to mention comes with a metric of constant scalar curvature minus two. Equivalently, every Y will be the quotient of the complex upper half plane H by a discrete subgroup of PSL2Z. Now, in Mirzakhani's work, it's important to allow Y to have boundaries, and the boundaries are always assumed to be geodesics. So a geodesic has a length, and the lengths of the geodesics are some of the moduli. And it's best to define the moduli space keeping the length fixed. So she studies a moduli space M sub G B, where G is the genus, and B is a length of, list of lengths of the boundaries. So if it's a Riemann surface of genus G with N boundary circles, then there are N positive real numbers, B1 up to BN, and we specify that those are the lengths. Now, this moduli space has a Vey Peterson volume that's defined the same way as in the absence of boundaries, and Mirzakhani computes this volume. Now, a key tool is that a hyperbolic Riemann surface Y, which might have geodesic boundaries, can be built by gluing together three hold spheres with geodesic boundaries. Now, it's really hard to draw a negative curvature. So, in this picture, not everything everywhere has negative curvature, but you should imagine that each of the three hold spheres has constant negative curvature minus two with geodesic boundaries. The ge the geodesic boundaries are more convincingly drawn than the negative curvature. Now, the subtlety of Riemann surface theory is that anything you might want to do, if it can be done, usually can be done in many different ways. So in this case, there are many different ways to, um, to decompose this Riemann surface by gluing together three hold spheres. That's basically because of the mapping class group. If you take a transformation in the mapping class group, it'll map these four circles to four different circles. They won't be geodesics, but you can adjust them in their homology class to make them geodesics again by minimizing their length. So a mapping class transformation would map this picture to another picture that would be a different way to decompose the same Riemann surface in terms of a union of three hold spheres. Now, if the decomposition, uh, I'm not sure if this line on my, okay. If the decomposition in three-held spheres with geodesic boundary were unique, 
we get a simple recursion relation for volumes. So uh, here I've drawn a slightly different picture. This is a Riemann surface of genus two with one boundary. Well, I've drawn a decomposition, but the important part of it is just the first three hold sphere that's connected to the boundary. So I've labeled its boundaries B, B1, and B2. Uh, I'm worried about the noise from downstairs. I'm closing a window just so you don't hear some noise from outside throughout the world. Now, a three hold sphere, it's only moduli are the boundary lengths. But this part, the right part of the picture could have a lot of moduli. The moduli of the complete picture would be B, which we've held fixed, then B1 and B2 are variable, and whatever else is over here. So if the decomposition was unique, we get the volume of the big surface, the whole thing, by integrating over B1 and B2 and integrating over these moduli. So the formula we get would be that the volume of genus two with B specified would be gotten by integrating over B1 and B2 times the volume of the part of the surface on the right. And the appropriate measure for integrating over B1 and B2 is just B1 dB1 and B2 dB2, where the factors of B1 and B2 come from integrating over twists that enter when you glue together the left and right of the picture. Now, this formula is wrong. And it's wrong because the decomposition wasn't unique. There was no modular invariant way to pick a particular three hold sphere with the given boundary. So the right hand, the integral on the right hand side will actually diverge. And it diverges because you're counting the same Riemann surface many times. But it's important that the failure to include modular invariants is the only thing wrong with this formula. So here's a similar formula without integrating. So this is not meant to be a formula for volumes, but for volume forms. So while V with this font was the volume, curly V with the same subscripts is meant to be the volume form that you would integrate to get the volume. So curly V is the VP volume form. And likewise, curly V with different indices is the VP volume form on the right. And then I haven't tried to integrate over B1 and B2. I've just written volume forms. So this formula is actually correct as a relation between volume forms rather than integrated volumes. But if you try to integrate it to get the volumes, it goes wrong because this you'd integrate over the moduli space allowing for the mapping class group of the small surface. Here you'd have to allow for the mapping class group of the big surface. And the big surface has a bigger mapping class group than the small surface. So if you try to integrate this formula, you have trouble. It doesn't properly take the mapping class group into account. Well, simply integrating the formula over the moduli space of this surface will take into account the mapping class group on the right, but not the full mapping class group of the total surface. Now to belabor this point, the moduli space of Riemann surfaces is a moduli space of flat PSL to R connections divided by the mapping class group. You have to divide by the mapping class group to get a finite volume. If instead of the non-compact group PSL2R, we considered a compact gauge group such as SU2, then you would divide the moduli space of flat connections without dividing by the mapping class group, and their volumes do obey a simple identity analogous to the naive one. So the naive identity is true for SU2, but it's wrong for PSL2R because in the PSL to R case, you have to divide by the mapping class group. The need to divide by the mapping class group means there's no simple identity like that one. This is the difficulty that Maria Mirzikani overcame. Now, here's the basic idea of how she did it. Consider any choice of a three hold sphere lambda with uh, so with this boundary, with this particular circle gamma <coughs> of length B as one of its boundaries. So what I've actually drawn in the picture, it's a possible lambda, but there are infinitely many possible lambdas. Consider any possible choice of lambda and let B1 and B2 be its other lengths, boundary lengths. Suppose there were a function F of three positive real numbers such that the sum over all lambdas of f of the boundary lengths of lambda was one. 
If there was such a function, we could fix the naive identity by simply inserting a factor of f on the right-hand side. We'd be counting all the possible lambdas, but weighting them with a factor of f, which adds to one, would give us the right answer. So the right-hand side, assuming we integrate it over the moduli space of the smaller surface, would involve a drastic overcounting, but inserting one in this form would correct for that. So the insertion of f would compensate for the fact that the smaller surface has a smaller mapping class group. Well, McShane had found an identity of roughly the necessary form in a particular case, which was a hyperbolic torus with one puncture, and Mirzakhani generalized it to hyperbolic surfaces with geodesic boundaries in any number of boundaries, any genus. To explain how, the basic idea is the following. So I've drawn a surface again, and I've picked a boundary, and I've picked a point in the boundary, and then L sub P is the geodesic orthogonal to the boundary at P. So I've drawn a little bit of that geodesic, and now you imagine continuing it. If you continue it, there are a few things that might happen. Well, if it's continued, it might go on forever without either intersecting itself or returning to the boundary. It might return to the boundary it started from. It might leave the surface by a different boundary. That's not possible in the case I drew where there's only one boundary, but in a different example with another boundary over here, this geodesic might spiral around and leave by some other boundary. I'll draw a picture on the next slide. Or it might intersect itself. Now, if it doesn't go on forever without intersecting itself or leaving the surface, then it will do one of the other three, and it will do one of them first. So every P either leads to an orthogonal geodesic that goes on forever, or else that does one of these three first. Now, a theorem of Berman in series says that the probability of outcome zero is zero. Probability means that the set of P's where outcome zero happens has measure zero. So the boundary is a Riemannian manifold of length B, and the subset consisting of things that do outcome zero is actually a complicated kind of set, but it has measure zero. So with probability one, there's an outcome of type one, two, or three. And in this figure, I've illustrated the three possibilities. Here, the orthogonal geodesic leaves by a different boundary. Here, it goes around and returns by the same boundary. And here it intersects itself with before it does either one of those two. Now the next sentence in italics is the key point of the whole proof and it's kind of surprising. If you just give the boundary gamma, there are infinitely many choices of a three-hold sphere with that as one of its geodesic boundaries. But if you give a point P and therefore this geodesic LP, then a distinguished three-hold sphere with geodesic boundaries is naturally determined. I think it's surprising. So the way you do it, well, I've explained it in parentheses, but to say it in words, well, let me, as an example, take this picture C. You take the boundary and you also take this LP. Well, you take the union of those two arcs, one is a circle, one's a semicircle, and you thicken it slightly with a little mental effort, you should be able to see that the thickened version topologically is a three-hold sphere. One boundary is a geodesic we started with. Uh, one boundary goes around up above LP and also around the semicircle here. It's a circle, it's not a geodesic. The other boundary is a circle below. You take those two other circles and minimize their lengths in their homotopy classes. And when you've minimized their lengths, they become geodesics and you get a three-hold sphere that contains P and LP and is canonically associated with that pair. The same thing works in the other two cases, except that in A, you take the union of the two boundaries along with P, uh, LP rather, thicken it a little, the thickened version is a three-hold sphere, and then two, now two of the boundaries are already geodesics, and the third one, when you minimize its length, becomes this geodesic label L tilde. Anyway, in each case, so gamma itself doesn't determine a three-hold sphere, 
but gamma and a point on it, except for a set of measure zero, does determine a three-hold sphere by this construction. So let epsilon be the set of all three-held spheres with boundary, the original geodesic gamma, little gamma, and two internal geodesics. So uh, in case B or C, the three-held sphere that's shaded is an element in epsilon. And in the other case, I define a set epsilon i, which labels all possibilities for what the three-held sphere might be given that its second geodesic boundary geodesic is gamma i. So epsilon i is a set of all lambdas that match the first picture, and epsilon is a set of all lambdas that match picture B or C with a particular, yeah, okay, the set of all such lambdas that match such a picture. If lambda is in epsilon, let A lambda be the subset of gamma that leads to a picture B or C with a particular lambda. So every P, every L sub P will lead to one of these pictures, but you can change P a little bit and get the same picture. A lambda is the subset of the boundary that leads to a particular three-hold sphere. And in case A, B lambda is the subset that leads to this picture, again, with a particular three-hold sphere. And let mu of A lambda and mu of B lambda be the measures of A lambda and B lambda. Let's measure with respect to the Ramanian length of the boundary. Now gamma has length B, and except for a measure set of measure zero, every point in gamma is uniquely in one of the A lambdas or B lambdas. So we get a sum rule that B is the sum of the measures of the A lambdas plus the sum of the measures of the B lambdas. And that's the sum rule Mirzakhani uses generalizing the naive sum rule. Earlier I mentioned a more simple kind of sum rule that would have solved the problem, but she observed that this sum rule instead is more complicated, but also solves her problem. Now for a given lambda, the quantities mu of A lambda and mu of B lambda only involve properties of geodesics in lambda. So they only depend on the three boundary lengths B, B1, and B2 of lambda, and not on the complicated genus G surface that lambda might be embedded in. As a result, these functions are functions of the three lengths that can be computed explicitly, as Mirtikani did. And toward the end of my talk, I'll explain how to do that. But for now, we'll just say that these are explicitly computable functions. So the sum rule has an explicit form in terms of known functions. And she inserts, see, she computes b times the volume. And for b, she substitutes this. And each term involves a choice of a three-held sphere with the given boundary. And that gives a way of building her surface out of a three-held sphere glued onto a simpler surface. And then by doing that, she gets an explicit formula where B times the volume she wants is an integral over some intermediate lengths where gluing happens of these known functions, mu of A lambda and mu of B lambda, times a volume of a smaller surface. And the three terms in her recursion relation correspond to the three topologically distinct ways that a surface Y might be built by gluing a three-hold sphere onto a simpler surface Y prime. So one possibility is that Y prime has two internal geodesics that connect to the same component of Y prime, or, sorry, lambda has two internal geodesics that connect to the same surface Y prime. Lambda could have two internal geodesics that connect to different components or lambda could have another external boundary and an internal boundary that connects to some y prime. So these three terms, if you work it out in detail, you'll see that the three pictures correspond to the three terms in her recursion relation. In each case though, the recursion relation expresses a volume as a sum of contributions or actually an integral of contributions, each of which involves the volume of a surface of less negative Euler characteristic. So by induction, this eventually reduces to the volume for a single three-hold sphere, and that volume is one. So this is a recursion relation that you can explicitly evalu uh, evaluate to determine all the volumes. And it's actually quite useful. So first, first of all, for a given case you're interested in, 
you can literally explicitly do all the integrals and get the volumes. But she also showed that it's useful for general theory. She used her recursion relation to prove many old and new facts about volumes and intersection numbers on moduli space. And it had many later repercussions. Her recursion relation was interpreted by Aynard and Orenton in terms of topological recursion for a particular spectral curve. And this was the starting point for the work of Saad, Schenker, and Stanford on JT gravity as a matrix model. And that paper was the starting point for my work with Stanford. But as I remarked at the beginning, today I will only describe the geometrical part of that work, not the part related to random matrices and quantum gravity. Now let's go over to super Riemann surfaces. Well, super Riemann surfaces in string theory are most studied as holomorphic objects. And as holomorphic objects, they're very subtle. So I'm going to give the holomorphic definition, although we don't want to do much with it today. So from a holomorphic point of view, a super Riemann surface y hat is a complex manifold of dimension one slash one meaning locally you can parameterize it by an even variable z, a bosonic, if you like, complex variable, and an odd var or anti-commuting complex variable theta, or some additional structure. The additional structure is a distribution of rank zero slash one that's completely unintegrable. The distribution is just a sub-bundle of the tangent bundle. So it, a distribution can be described by giving a vector field such as this one, up to multiplying by an invertible function. So any two invertible functions times this, or any multiple of it, non-zero multiple of this defines the same distribution. You can always pick local coordinates such that the distribution is generated by what I've indicated here. And then you can compute that d theta squared, which is d by dz, is everywhere linearly independent of d theta, which is what's meant by complete unintegrability of the distribution. So this definition leads to a theory surprisingly in close parallel to the classical theory of Riemann surfaces. I think a fascinating and largely understudied mathematical theory. However, it's definitely a definition that takes some getting used to. And I'm not really going to uh, try to help you get used to that definition today because for today, we're really interested in hyperbolic super Riemann surfaces, which almost don't require any familiarity with that definition. I'll make slight use of it a couple of times. So today we're studying super Riemann surfaces from a hyperbolic point of view. And from that point of view, the definition is perhaps more obvious. We simply replace a Lie group, PSL2R, by a supergroup, OSP1 slash two. So, well, OSP1 slash two, it's maximal bosonic subgroup is not PSL2R, but the double cover SL2R. So we really generalize SL2R, and that's inescapable. PSL2R doesn't have a useful super extension, but SL2R does. SL2R can be defined as the automorphism group of R2 with a symplectic form DUDV, well, linear automorphism group, leaving fixed the origin. Similarly, OSP1 slash two is the linear group of automorphisms of a symplectic form of R2 slash one. So this is R2 slash one with bosonic coordinates U and V and a fermionic coordinate curly theta. And the symplectic form is DU wedge DV minus D theta squared. So formally you define OSP one slash two the same way you might define SL2R, except there's a fermionic variable. Now the usual upper half plane is PSL2R divided by U1 or it's SL2R divided by U1. If you replace PSL2R by a double cover, SL2R, you have to replace U1 by double cover, but the double cover is just a bigger U1. And the super analog of the upper half plane is OSP1 slash two divided by U1, where U1 is a subgroup of SL2R, the same subgroup we used here. And SL2R is embedded in OSP1 slash two. So U1 is actually a maximal torus in OSP1 slash two. OSP1 slash two has fermionic generators, but none of them commute with this U1. So even after taking a super extension, the same U1 is still a maximal torus. 
So a hyperbolic Riemann surface is H mod gamma, where I defined H here, for a discrete subgroup of PSL2R. And similarly, a hyperbolic super Riemann surface is H hat mod gamma, where now gamma is a discrete subgroup of OSP1 slash 2. So this is an old story where the original references go back to the 1980s. I might say an old story that's been somewhat more studied recently, but still hasn't been that much extensively studied. Now in classical Riemann surface, lifting gamma from PSL2R to SL2R means endowing the two manifold Y with a spin structure. And in the super case, there was no way to avoid this lift because the bosonic subgroup of OSP1 slash 2 is SL2R, not PSL2R. So a super Riemann surface always comes with a spin structure. Its classical limit is an ordinary Riemann surface with a spin structure. Now, a Vey Peterson symplectic form on the moduli space of super Riemann surfaces and various generalizations for super Riemann surfaces with punctures or boundaries can be defined by imitating any of the classical definitions. So I'm not really telling you today any of the classical definitions of the Vey Peterson form, but if you're familiar with any definition, it has a super analog. A compact super symplectic supermanifold has a volume, so we can define the volume V hat G of MG, and the goal is to find a Mirzikhani style method to calculate it. At the end, I also will explain a formula for the supervolumes in terms of ordinary bosonic geometry. Let me describe the super upper half plane a little more concretely. So we recall that OSP1 slash 2 was defined by the way it acts on R2 slash 1 with these linear coordinates preserving a symplectic form. So you could projectivize these coordinates and they become homogeneous coordinates for RP1 slash 1, which has UV and theta as homogeneous coordinates. RP1 slash 1 is just a super circle. It's convenient to introduce affine coordinates. Z is a bosonic variable, V over U. Theta is curly theta over U. And then, <coughs> <clears throat> then OSP1 slash 2 acts on Z and theta by a super analog of fractional linear transformations. <clears throat> so far, Z and theta are naturally real. Now, OSP1 slash 2 obviously still acts on them if we complexify them. If we complexify them but take Z to have positive imaginary part, we get one description of the super upper half plane H hat. So this definition makes it manifest that the super upper half plane is a complex manifold. And this complex manifold has a super Riemann surface structure that's invariant under OSP1 slash 2. And it's inherited from the symplectic structure we started with. So roughly what happens is that when you projectivize, a symplectic structure becomes what's called a um, contact structure. And the non-integral distribution is a contact structure. So every, so the upper half plane has a super Riemann surface structure that's invariant under OSP1 slash 2. So every quotient by subgroup of OSP1 slash 2 is also a super Riemann surface. What do we mean by geodesic in the super upper half plane? There are lots of ways to define it, but perhaps the quickest is the following. By setting the odd coordinate to zero, we get an embedding of the ordinary upper half plane in the super upper half plane. So you know what are geodesics in the ordinary upper half plane. I simply declare that a geodesic in the ordinary upper half plane is an example of a geodesic in the super upper half plane. Of course, it's a sub-manifold of dimension 1 slash 0. Acting with OSP 1 slash 2, we can transform L to another sub-manifold of dimension 1 slash 0, which we also call a geodesic. These are the geodesics in the super upper half plane. If L in the super upper half plane is ge geodesic and P is a point in L, there's no problem with the notion of an orthogonal geodesic to L at P. We just transform to the case that L is in the ordinary upper half plane. In that frame, you already know what's meant by an orthogonal geodesic. And since every L is equivalent to this one by an OSP1 slash 2 transformation, that's defined for you L perp in general. 
Now, the notion of a super Riemann surface with geodesic boundary takes a little bit of discussion. What I think is, th the reason it does is the following. As a real supermanifold, a super Riemann surface has dimension two slash two. So its boundary, which should be of co-dimension one slash zero, should have dimension one slash two. But a geodesic by the dimension, by the definition I gave has dimension one slash zero. I think the best explanation is that a geodesic has a canonical thickening of dimension one slash two that's obtained by displacing it in the direction of the unintegral distribution. This wouldn't work in bosonic geometry. If you have an unintegral geodesic, uh, sorry, distribution on a bosonic manifold, precisely because it's unintegral, it doesn't have leaves, and you wouldn't know how to move in the direction of, in the unintegral di di directions. But in the super case with a completely odd, completely fermionic unintegral distribution, obeying a mild condition that's satisfied here that I won't state, it does make sense. And there is a canonical thickening. So the geodesic actually determines a canonical dimension one slash two submanifold. And that's really what's the boundary of a geodesic super Riemann surface with geodesic boundary. But as a shorthand, I just say, I just talk about a super Riemann surface with geodesic boundary. Now, just as in the classical case, super Riemann surfaces with geodesic boundary can be evoked by gluing together three hold spheres with geodesic boundary. And once we get this far, it's not too hard to see that all previous statements have super analogs. And in fact, the original super McShane identity has been also generalized in this paper. So, uh, but, uh, okay. To state the situation for Riemann surfaces with geodesic boundary, if Y hat is a super Riemann surface with geodesic boundary and gamma is one of its geodesic boundaries and P is a point in gamma, then the geodesic gamma perp orthogonal to gamma at P has the same options as before. It could go on forever without intersecting itself or returning to gamma. Uh, we need to explain what intersecting itself means, but I'll skip that. Um, it could return to gamma well, a simple definition is to say that if you do mod the odd variables and intersects itself, then we say it intersects itself. It could return to gamma, it could leave by a different boundary or it could in intersect itself. The measure for option zero is again zero. By the way, since the boundary is an ordinary manifold, a geodesic of dimension one size zero, it has an ordinary Riemannian measure metric with length b again. So p is just a point in an ordinary circle. Gamma is an ordinary circle. And it's again true that option zero corresponds to a subset of the circle of measure zero. So we only have to consider options one, two, and three. And the three alternatives lead to the same pictures as before, in each case, picking out a three-hold sphere containing gamma. So again, we get a sum rule in which gamma of total measure B is decomposed after throwing away a set of measure zero as a disjoint union of subsets that correspond to one of the three old spheres that can appear in the picture. And again, to determine the measure of the piece corresponding to a particular three old sphere with given boundary lengths is a universal computation that only depends on those boundary lengths. So, same picture as before, except now it's a super Riemann surface. And I've drawn a little bit of a geodesic orthogonal to a boundary. And we have to do a universal computation in that three-old sphere. I'll tell you a little bit about it later, shortly. After doing this computation, we again get a Mirzikani style recursion relation. It has the same general form as before, but with different universal functions that come from, well, really, they. They correspond to these three options. Well, the three terms correspond to these three ways to build a surface as a three-hold sphere glued onto something else. I think this one corresponds to that. This, uh, sorry, this probably corresponds to this, and this corresponds to this. But the universal functions are different functions that we get by studying this picture now for super Riemann surface. 
Now, Mertikani's recursion relation was interpreted by Aynard and Orrington in terms of topological recursion for a spectral curve, this one, whose relation to JT gravity was the starting point for Sa'ad et al. And Stanford and I showed that the superversion of the recursion relation is related in the same way to a spectral curve that has a similar, similar relation to JT supergravity. This spectral curve has been introduced earlier by Norbury with a different motivation. Putting these facts together, the volumes of supermoduli spaces are related to random matrix theory, just like the volumes of ordinary moduli spaces. Now, I think I still have five minutes and there are two facts I'd still like to explain. One is how to compute the universal functions in the recursion relations. And two is what volumes of supermoduli spaces mean in terms of ordinary geometry. On the first point, if lambda is a hyperbolic three-held sphere with geodesic boundaries, then its universal cover is a region in the upper half plane bounded by three geodesics. To draw the pictures uh, symmetrically, it's convenient to use the disk model for the upper half plane. And then the picture looks like this. The circle is the boundary of the disk. The, the disk, it represents the upper half plane. The universal cover of lambda is this region and the semicircles are the boundary geodesics. That's the picture in the disk model. To do the computation, it's convenient to break the symmetry. See, in the computation we want to do, one of the three boundaries plays a distinguished role. It's where the orthogonal geodesic starts. It's convenient to map to the upper half plane with this particular geodesic as a vertical straight line. And then we want to know what's the probability that an orthogonal geodesic ends here on this circle. So the picture becomes this one. This is the orthogonal geodesic that we start with. And the orthogonal geodesics to it are semicircles centered at this point x0 where the orthogonal geodesic leaves the boundary of the upper half plane. And here's one of the other geodesics. And we want to know the condition for an orthogonal geodesic which needs a semicircle to meet gamma had this other semicircle. And the limiting cases that don't quite meet it are these two semicircles that end at x1 and x2. And they emanate from the points that I've labeled on the vertical axis. And b prime is the interval on the boundary consisting of orthogonal geodesics that will end on this boundary before they do anything else first. And so one of our universal functions is just the length of b prime. One of Maria, Maria Marzucani's functions is the length of b prime uh, in the metric on the upper half plane. So that gives one of her functions in the bosonic case. And actually, once you compute that one, it's trivial to get the others. And a super version of the same picture uh, gives the universal functions for the super Riemann surface case. If you want more detail, it's in Appendix D of my paper with Stanford. In fact, the whole lecture basically is in Appendix D of the paper with Stanford. So the lesson here, this was a simple computation. So the set B prime that maps, that exits, well, if you, so the lesson is that for a single three-hold sphere, the decomposition according to what happens to an orthogonal geodesic is simple. The complication of the original problem is that if all you're given is the boundary, there are infinitely many choices of which three-held sphere might be relevant. So the decomposition of this boundary circle that enters Mitsukani's sum rule is very complicated. And the measure zero set that was thrown away is actually a Cantor-like set. But once you pick a particular three-held sphere to do the universal computation, it's actually all quite simple. Now on the second point, for which I have one minute, I claim there's a useful general formula for the volume of a symplectic supermanifold. In general, let M hat be a smooth supermanifold with reduced space M. M is defined by setting odd variables to zero. In other words, by reducing functions on M modular nilpotence. M is canonically embedded in M hat with the normal bundle V that's completely fermionic. As a smooth supermanifold, M hat is just the total space of this normal bundle. That description is highly non-unique and in general would not exist holomorphically. Supermoduli space is an example in which there is no such description holomorphically as Denagi and I showed. 
but not in 1993, maybe in 2013. So anyway, in the smooth world, there is such a description. And then we, there's a projection pi from m hat to m. Now, suppose that m hat is actually has, is a symplectic supermanifold with symplectic form omega hat. Restricting omega hat to m, you learn that m is an ordinary symplectic manifold whose symplectic form is restriction of omega hat to m. Moreover, you can evaluate omega hat along m as a bilinear form on the fibers of the normal bundle, and that gives a symmetric and non-degenerate quadratic form on the normal bundle. So the structure group of the normal bundle reduces to the orthogonal group. Now, since the fibers of m hat to m are topologically trivial, being purely fermionic, well, to say it in a fancy way, you use the spectral sequence for the fibration and prove the cohomology is the same as the cohomology of the base. So the supersymplectic form of the total space is a pullback from the base plus an exact form. Now, in the bosonic world, you'd say that the volume is independent of the exact form. In the super world, you have to be more careful. The volume of, that you would define for omega hat is only well defined if omega hat obeys a certain non-degeneracy condition. And the correct statement is that the volume doesn't depend on psi if psi is sufficiently generic so that the volume is defined. Now, the, remembering that the normal bundle had an orthogonal structure, you can pick a connection A on this orthogonal vector bundle and for any such connection, you get a convenient choice of psi. You can write this way. The one form psi is the sum of theta d theta, where theta are odd coordinates associated to a local orthonormal trivialization of the vector bundle. And capital D is the gauge covariant exterior derivative. So the thetas aren't globally defined, but the one form psi is. And so you can use it in this formula. And with this psi, you can do an easy computation of the volume and get a formula that the volume is the integral over m of the exponential of the symplectic form times the Euler class of the normal bundle. In the example studied in this talk, the supermanifold is the moduli space of super Riemann surfaces. The reduced space is the moduli space of ordinary Riemann surfaces with the spin structure. Perhaps they both have geodesic boundaries. And after shrinking the geodesic boundaries to punctures, which doesn't affect the topological invariant chi of v, V can be identified in holomorphic terms as the vector bundle whose fiber is this sheaf cohomology group, which people who do uh, superstring perturbation theory will know as the vector bundle of odd moduli. And that's the, well, with this definition of V, uh, this formula is the expression studied by Norbury. So anyway, the super volumes are quantities that can be defined purely in terms of the ordinary moduli spaces the moduli space of genus G surfaces with a spin structure and maybe with geodesic boundaries. Uh, in sum, therefore, I've reviewed Mario Mirzakani's recursion relation that determines the volumes of the moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces. And I've explained that the necessary ingredients have analogs in the supercase. I've given some idea of how to compute the functions that come into the recursion relation. And I explained that what we computed in the supercase as a purely bosonic interpretation. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Um, we have time for questions. Shira Sekander. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if uh, there's an analog of a super mapping class group as well, because uh, that's where you started off from and uh, uh, how the mapping class group was changing uh, the geodesic length in the uh, original case. Um, well, this is, uh, mapping class group is a topological notion. Right. It's, topology so isn't really changed by supervising. Oh. So this mapping class group of a super human surface is the same as the mapping class group of it's bosonic reduction. There simply is no topology in the odd directions. So I, uh, and, and there's a, an analog of a super Teichmuller space as well, but with the same mapping class group acting on it. That's right. Okay. 
things. And uh, another thing, uh, not about moduli spaces, but a specific uh, uh, super Riemann surfaces themselves. Um, in the ordinary case, in the, uh, in the case of uh, hyperbolic uh, surfaces, uh, to study the length spectrum, there are two things that become very important. In, uh, one is um, conjugacy classes of uh, hyperbolic elements of the group that you quotient out by. And the second is, uh, is uh, the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator and uh, the Selberg uh, theory basically connects the two. Um, is there an analog of say Zellberg uh, zeta function or Zellberg theory basically, um, which uh, for super Riemann surfaces? Uh, I'm not aware it's been worked out, but I also could be forgetful. Uh, it might be relatively close to Docker and following did, things Docker and following did, but I really don't remember this. I feel it makes perfect sense that there should be such an analog. Uh, and I don't know the answer of whether it's known. Well, <clears throat> the Selberg trace formula is a formula for the determinant of the Laplacian. Yes. So the first question is what's the analog? Yeah, what's the elliptic operator on functions here? Yeah. Well, uh, what you would do would be to take what's called a scalar superfield. A massive scalar superfield. See, in the case of a split, okay, the, the simple, <clears throat> okay, remember a super Riemann surface was defined using a discrete subgroup of OSP1 slash 2, but a special case would be a discrete subgroup of SL2R. <clears throat> That's kind of the trivial case where you get what's called a split super Riemann surface. Then you would take the direct sum of the Laplacian and the Dirac operator. And a yes answer to your question is only possible if there's a good Selberg trace formula for the Dirac operator. I'm worried that there is for its square, but not for the unsquared Dirac operator. But, uh, sorry, I hope that there is. Sorry, I think- well, okay. the, For the Dirac operator, do you expect the eigenvalues to be related to something like the geodesics? That's... Well, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, Well, I, I'm, I actually don't know a lot about the Selberg trace formula. So for spin J, there's some kind of Selberg trace formula for an ordinary human surface. Ah, okay. But I don't remember what it says. And I've seen it written for integer J. I assume it exists for half integer J if you're willing to pick a spin structure. I don't really know that. That has to be true in order for the question for superhuman surfaces to have a chance. If there is such a formula for if there is a half integral spin form Selberg trace formula in an ordinary VM1 surface, then there's a good chance it superizes. What you would do is you take the direct sum of spin zero or spin half, possibly the direct sum of spin J and spin J plus half in general, but spin J is going, J equals zero is going to be more straightforward for various reasons. Okay, the question, my answer shows you it's that I don't know the answer to your question. And there are preliminaries I don't really know also. All right. Um, I think if there is such a formula, though, it, it, it's definitely worth understanding it. That's all I should really say, tell you for sure. Cool, thanks. I have another question, but... Uh, yes, maybe. Go ahead. Uh, uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, again, I mean, I feel it's a little generic just doing uh, the stuff for classical to super, but uh, one thing, is, I mean, in the classical case, if you quotient out by discrete subgroups of PSL2Z of... Uh, so arithmetic groups, not just PSL2R. Yes. Uh, you get uh, modular curves and uh, sections of a certain line bundle on it are modular forms or automorphic forms for SL2Z. Right. Um, it, are there arithmetic subgroups for uh, this uh, supergroup uh, OSP12? I don't think so, because that's a little bit like asking whether there's a super analog of a rational number. I don't think so. I don't get that analogy, but oh uh, yeah, okay, okay, because the entries have to be a super analog of the rational. Yep. Yes. True. Okay. Okay, thank you, um, Ashwin Balasubramanian. Oh hi, yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, I had a question. So is there a supersymmetric analog of the Fenchel Nielsen coordinates uh, for the super moduli spaces? If yes, like what's like the super partner to the length or the twist? Well, there is, there is, and it was implicit in my lecture. I just didn't explain it because I was trying to, um, well, trying to do the lecture in the available time. Uh, so I kind of hit it. I hope, uh, let me try to find the right picture. 
There are fentanyl Nielsen coordinates with one difference. So to a geodesic, it, okay. Where in the world is my picture? I'm just looking for a picture of a Riemann surface built by gluing together three held spheres. Here, okay. So, it, okay. in the bosonic case, when you build a Riemann surface by gluing together three held spheres with hyperbolic boundaries, locally its moduli are lengths for each of these geodesics. Mm -hmm. Also, a twist by which they're glued together. That means you could cut on the circle, glue one side, sorry, rotate one side by a length theta and then glue them back together again. Mm -hmm. So there's a length and a twist for each circle. But there are no moduli for each three-held sphere. Right. Because in the hyper in the bosonic world, a three-held sphere has no moduli except its boundary lengths. Right. Now the difference in supercase is that a three-held sphere has two odd moduli. So when you take this picture, um, Fenchel and Nielsen coordinates mean the same as before for every circle but two odd coordinates for every three old sphere. And there's no odd coordinate to the boundary itself? There's no. Only... Okay. no. Right. Okay. And Douglas, uh, sorry, Stanford and I wrote the Bay peterson form in Fenchel Nielsen coordinates, in super Fenchel Nielsen coordinates. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, I don't want to claim nobody else has done it. Uh, um, I can't remember everything that's been done. Panner and his co-authors have written the Vey Peterson symplectic form explicitly in a different coordinate system where they used um, hyperbolic triangles. Okay. Uh, I don't know exactly how it's related to this. Uh, but anyway, we definitely wrote the Vey Peterson form in Fenchel Nielsen coordinates. Oh, okay. sorry, 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 my, sorry. We wrote the Vey Peterson volume form in Fenchel Nielsen coordinates. Uh, okay. My statement isn't quite true. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. I. Uh, okay. It, my statement isn't quite true, but. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, actually, okay. Uh, I actually did compute it. Okay. You see, we used in our paper we used not the vape, we used not the symplectic definition of the volume form, but the torsion, and the reason we did was that we were interested in unorientable two manifolds. Where the, where the moduli space isn't symplectic. So we computed the volume, Bay Peterson volume form in these coordinates using the torsion. Yeah, okay. I don't want, I exaggerated when I said before what we've done. Any Thank other you. questions? Asha Voronov? Uh, hello. When you create a pair of pens uh, in the super case uh, out of uh, an orthogonal geodesic, uh, will the new uh, geodesic boundaries that show up and be always of never Schwartz type, or uh, could do you have to mess with Ramon type boundaries? Uh, they're of both types. Never Schwartz types? Oh, no, they're of both types. Oh, both types. Okay, yeah, that's it's what I thought. They have to be of both types because this, to within infinitesimal corrections, the geodesics are the same as they are bosonically, and in the split case, they're literally the same. And the spin structure could be anything. So it could be a Vermont or a Neverschwitz type on either yeah. circle. Mm -hmm. I kind of hid such issues in the talk, but. Um, How would this affect the computation of the volume? Uh, I, uh, I would expect more terms in the, in the uh, recursion formula. Um, we showed that, the, you can, that you can write a correct formula with only the Neverschwitz contributions. Mm -hmm. I see. OK, thank you. Sure. Come on, Papa. It's a nice talk. Um, I have a question uh, regarding the uh, topological string perspective on this. So yes. things that compute on things on marginalized space are typical the bread and butter of topological strings. Whereas uh, the marginalized space of, uh, and for example, your old work, that's the kind of thing that you did with the context of Montfort classes and so forth. But in the context of Mirza Khani's models, uh, in the context of topological A model, I have not seen any formulation of a topological A model which computes the marginalized, uh, the volume of the marginalized space. Uh, if one had such a formulation, that could open up a path to a new proof of Mirza Khani's model, because we know that Mirza Khani's model is equivalent to topological B model on a Calabria threefold. So if you have a direct op topological A model formulation of it, which computes the marginalized space volumes, then mirror symmetry will be another derivation of Mirza Khani's model for that model. Uh, that would be that would be advantageous, perhaps in some ways, because instead of getting a recursion relation which satisfies the correct formula, you directly get the answer. So 
So the whole thing then boils down to understanding whether there's a topological A model, which directs mm -hmm. the compute the marginalized space of uh, the volume of marginalized space. And that's the question I wanted to ask you. Are you familiar with such a model? <laughs> well, uh, is, there, is there something that you have? Quite. Not quite. Well, suppose we were interested in the Euler characteristic of marginalized space. What answer would you give there? That, that we know that topological A model does compute it. That's, it, that's in fact, the topological A model and Calavia threefold computes, the, computes it uh, for the case of the conifer, for example. Yeah. Uh, so that, uh, there's a different answer I thought you might have given. If you take the um, minimal model with a... <clears throat> oh, yes, I was giving the mirror answer. Yes, the topological A model would be the mirror model that you probably want to answer, yes. If you take the... Um, if you take the um, uh, well, something you can do on ordinary V1 surfaces is to couple to a lambda Ginsburg minimal model, an n equals two minimal model with a phi to the r superpotential. I think phi to the r plus one maybe. And then you topologically twist it. You get a topological field theory. And the partition function of that topological field theory is given by a formula similar to what I claimed here at the end, superficially similar, uh, except that the Euler class is not straightforward to define because things aren't locally free. So, where is it? Oh, this formula at the top, okay. So if you take a twisted minimal model and couple it to topological gravity, you, can, you get a partition function, which is like this, except that chi of e isn't straightforward to define. It depends on an integer r. And formally, if you continue to a crazy value of r, which is something like minus one, you get this formula with the same v. Right. Whereas the, uh, you get the Euler character of moduli space if you continue to something like r equals minus two. I might be giving the wrong values, but I think you're familiar with one continuation. Yes. And if you continue to a different negative value, you formally get this formula. Oh, you I, do? So you're, you're saying there's a formal way to get the volumes in that way? The super volumes. The super volumes, or the volumes also, right? Well, the, no, I don't know such a way to get the volumes. Oh, the oh, super No, 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 sorry, no, 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 sorry, no, 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 no. Well, I, what I'm saying is a little misleading. You have to couple to topological gravity. Uh, not the, you don't study. I'm not sure if that was part of what you wanted or not. No, no, I want topological gravity. I want topological A model gravity, topological strings. Okay, all right. Well, but you need to include this class omega, which might be, even though it's related to Mumford classes. Okay, you have to, to describe omega in terms of Mumford classes, you have to turn on the whole hierarchy, namely the hierarchy that appears in this uh, spectral curve. Oh, where did I write it? The coefficients in this hinge function are the yeah. coefficients. If you want to convert omega into Mumford classes, yeah. you have to use the coefficients of the hinge function as coupling constants. If you do that and you couple to the minimal model continue to some crazy negative value, then formally you get this. Right. Well, this is uh, this uh, that I understand. That's in your work with uh, uh, Robert in particular. You explained that connection with, with well, how you do how, to, how to express this in terms of Mumford classes. We explained. Yes. And then uh, the part I'm telling you is that this chi of v is a continuation to something like r equals minus one, or some I don't remember the value of the rth minimal model, rth n equals two minimal model, topologically twisted. I so but, you take something. This, like a one over phi superpotential. But this is not in the form of topological since so let's say on a Calabia or something like that. You wouldn't have that well, such a formulation. I can't put it that way, but it wouldn't shock me if you could. That's why I'm giving you this answer. I see, I see. Okay, you thank know you. Do, you know how to do the Euler characteristic, you say, and the Euler characteristic involves a similar and let a continuation to an equally crazy looking value. So if you can do that one, maybe you can do this one. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Are there any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank all the speakers um, and this session chair um, for the morning session uh, right now. Um, <clears throat> And given that we're 
um, having the public talk uh, in an hour from now, roughly. Um, we're not going to have a breakaway session, but I will leave the room open for another half an hour if um, people would like to ask questions of the speakers um, from the morning session and uh, or uh, of the last talk. Um, <clears throat> if you would just be so kind as to, uh, if you're asking a question to a particular speaker, state who the uh, speaker uh, is. Um, and otherwise we will close the session in half an hour so that I can open up the next Zoom room for the public talk. Thank you very much.